Hello Internet. It's been a while since I've done one of these, but I thought that it would be good to get back in the habit of talking about philosophy and maybe uh, geek things. So recently I started a, um, a philosophy group uh, in New York, and this is it's, it's a continuation of the way that I've been doing philosophy o over my life, and that there's a lot of reading that I've done. Uh, but there's also a social aspect to philosophy that's pretty important. Um, philosophers, just like anyone else, we do best when we have plenty of people around us to analyze our ideas, build upon them, connect them uh, to their own ideas, and probably most importantly, uh, give us criticism when we need it. It's in the mental sparring that we stay honest. Uh, it's necessary for sanity. And and so I've been missing this feeling of community for several years. Uh, back in Columbus, Ohio, when I was much, much younger, I was part of a philosophy group for a while. We met in this coffee shop called Town Addiction. Uh, I think we met like every week or maybe every two weeks. And it, there were generally maybe somewhere between four and eight of us there. We talk about ideas that we were playing with for a while. And uh, the rest of the group would chew on it, build co interesting connections, offer criticisms. Um, and it was great. It, it was nice to have a community. I mean, we didn't actually agree on much. And uh, like there were some members in the group who thought, I mean, who didn't, uh, who didn't fully believe that the apparent reality that science is exploring, they didn't think that that was necessarily the real thing. One of them made a pretty long argument about uh, about how the idea of space being empty is impossible. I mean, quite quite unrelated to the uh, the, the quantum foam idea. And it, it was I think it was tied to Pascal's wager somehow. But just the fact that we we kept on going back and forth over these things, and we would have this good combative attitude. It, it, uh, while st uh, while still trying to be uh, to be friendly with each other, it really kept us sharp. And I, I mean, the other the other part of that time of my life that was good for that was um, dealing with campus preachers. Which by dealing with, typically you would just argue with them. Uh, you would find holes in their in their logic, find problems with their arguments, and offer uh, counter arguments. Now, it, admittedly, it was in the context of. Um, speaking in front of a crowd and so it, it it had a certain direct to the people element to it that a, a, a better debate forum like Oxford debate doesn't have but but it, it still was good for keeping you sharp and on your toes and so I had a period of time when I lived in, in Pittsburgh uh, it was roughly 10 years that, that I spent there working uh, mostly working for Carnegie Mellon University as re uh, research uh, staff in a variety of positions. A good place to work. Um, but it was a time in my life when there wasn't a lot of uh, social philosophy. And I mean, I, I'd still got into arguments with students, but they were a lot younger than I was. They didn't really understand the world. Uh, and given that I'm particularly interested in political philosophy, that meant that it was hard to talk with them because they had a number of naive ideas. Um, but there also wasn't a lot of philosophical sophistication. And um, I mean, it isn't their fault. Not everybody's into philosophy. Uh, and even though probably more people should be because if you have a lot to say, and you don't recognize uh, philosophy, then you're going to badly reinvent it. Um, and that's kind of like what you see with Elisa Yudkowsky and the less wrong crowd. They don't bother to actually understand um, that there are centuries of thought that, that go into what it means to think carefully. And those, thought, uh, those centuries of thought have involved digging into the foundations of thought, what it really means to be empirical or rational. And so they have a not invented here syndrome that leads them into all sorts of uh, fallacies and problems. But 
But yeah, so I I, I was mostly alone and uh, philosophically alone in Pittsburgh, and that wasn't very helpful for my development in in philosophy. Um, I had a few friends who were kind of interested uh, in it, but it, it wasn't enough. Since leaving Pittsburgh, I briefly lived in Philadelphia, but I didn't really uh, grow any roots there. But I spent most of the last, I guess, year and a half in, in New York City, living in Brooklyn, but because New York City is a cosmopolitan city uh, with a uh, great transit system, uh, I pretty much have my run of the whole city. I can go to meetups anywhere, and it's really meetup. Uh, I mean, the meetup.com that's hooked me up with a lot of other people who are interested in philosophy. Um, I started going to uh, something called Dinner and uh, Philosophy now, that eventually renamed itself to just Dinner and Philosophy, that's run by a local uh, philosophy professor, and that's been. It's been pretty helpful. Um, it, it isn't quite shaped the way that, that, that I would like it to be, and that it's largely him lecturing with a little bit of, a little bit of back and forth. And I, I've been fairly aggressive in the group uh, because I have enough of a philosophical background to consider myself a philosopher, and I've written enough and argued enough that I consider myself on uh, on the necessary footing to have an even discussion with uh, with him and with uh, I guess there are a few other a, a few other people there who are really into philosophy I don't know if they consider me an equal I, I consider them equals and it doesn't really matter to me whether they uh, what they think of me there but there are also a few other philosophy groups that I've been attending but it's often hard to get into them there's a surprising appet uh, appetite for philosophy that just might be the scale of the city. There are a lot of people in New York. And philosophy, it's not an obscure interest, but it's not something that has typically interested a lot of people. But in a city this big, when you can draw from the people of, uh, of five boroughs, or more realistically four boroughs, because uh, Staten Islanders rarely interact with the rest of the city. But yeah, if you can pull, uh, pull people from four boroughs in, you're going to get a lot of people interested in philosophy just because the city is so big. And that means that it's sometimes hard to get into the groups. And I would like the ability to set topics a little bit more or at least not necessarily be constrained to the topics that uh, people are already uh, talking about. So I started a group. Um, and the first meeting was probably about a month and a half ago, or maybe two months. I'd, I'd actually need to check the dates. Um, but it went uh, reasonably well. Uh, we talked about, um, what was the first meeting about? We talked about, hmm. Well, uh, actually, I'm going to look that up. Um, this is a, a somewhat uh, distressing tendency of uh, of being in your mid thirties. Sometimes you forget what uh, sometimes you forget what uh, or forget things that really should be important to you. Uh, oh yeah, so we talked about um, Rawls and justice, uh, and John Rawls is one of my uh, favorite philosophers. He's a, an American political philosopher, and we dealt uh, we dug into the question of what what is justice. Um, and I, I gave a lecture, I guess briefly, on uh, Rawlsian philosophy, and, uh, and then we proceeded to uh, chew on whether the original position and the veil of ignorance are a, a good basic pairing of, of intuitions for what justice is. It went pretty well, um, at, at, well as I said. Um, I did have another one planned, um, which was going to be a walk in, in uh, Central Park uh, up in Manhattan. But unfortunately, oh, so I guess actually the first meeting was in uh, late July. So I planned a meeting in August, uh, in late August, uh, where it was going to be a walk in Central Park, and we were going to talk about demographics, immigration, and democracy, uh, largely focusing on Pim Fortune and the 
the difficulties in having uh, in the difficulties between two basic ideas in liberalism, largely the idea that we want to be an open society, a society that's open to new ideas, one that isn't uh, necessarily scared of foreigners. Uh, and then there's the problem of us trying to be tolerant. And there's a bit of a difficulty there when you might end up having mass immigration from parts of the world that are seeing political unrest, but nonetheless the immigration happens in a form where where you end up having a number of very conservative uh, people, I mean people far more conservative uh, than those in your uh, in your main society, uh, or I mean in in the society that would be permitting the immigration, that uh, uh, in in having them come in in mass uh, and ending up not tolerating some things that you would really like to have tolerated, like uh, like uh, gay rights, um, perhaps abortion, things of that sort, and and so in the uh, the Netherlands encountered this problem very roughly because they're a small country. They had very heavy Muslim immigration. Some of the Muslims that came in were very uh, non-Western in, in views. And so there was a certain amount of violence and threatened violence against uh, gay communities in, uh, in the Netherlands. And, and so this leaves uh, liberals, and I use the term very broadly, in, Enlightenment liberals, uh, really, or, or Enlightenment descended philosophy, uh, philosophies, people living in that tradition, meaning mostly Western societies, but not exclusively, it leaves them with a clash of values that's not easy to deal with. And so choosing between open immigration and between gay rights, or, or just in general, a liberal flavor of society, it's a tough choice, and um, and so uh, Pim Fortune was a, a a gay politician in the Netherlands uh, who advocated a certain limits to Muslim immigration because of this problem, and he was killed. And uh, there was also Theo, uh, Theo van Gogh, who was uh, um, who was also killed for fairly similar political activism. And so this has opened a debate in European society as to how to resolve these issues. And um, it's led to great strife within, uh, within those societies. As some people would say that you're, you're definitely espousing far-right uh, politics if you're, up for uh, if you're limiting immigration. And other people would say that no, it's the only way to preserve Enlightenment-style society, to be careful about the rate of immigration and perhaps be, uh, be careful about who is permitted to immigrate. So I wanted to do that one as my second um, event, but it's the first time I tried to hold it, it was raining, uh, and there actually was a severe uh, weather warning. And the second time, um, it was just getting a little bit too, uh, too late in the year to uh, hold a late night event that's a walk in Central Park. At some point I might rehab that uh, meeting, but um, but uh, for now it's just uh, just left as a canceled event. Uh, so the the one that I had about three days ago uh, was about uh, Slavoj, uh, or Slavoj, I think it's Slavoj uh, Zizek, I'll call him Slavoj, I, I might be mispronouncing his first name, and Sigmund Freud. And it was an investigation of the idea of violence and the context of violence. And basically, both Freud and uh, Zizek, they, they can be viewed as challenging certain naive forms of liberalism. Um, and again, liberalism, I'm using the term in that same very loose uh, Enlightenment-inspired sense, not necessarily parties that Americans or Europeans would call uh, liberal. So for Freud, uh, in his book, uh, Civilization and Its uh, Discontents, which I think I've probably already talk, uh, talked about in a prior video, uh, he, he mentions 
the idea of repressions as being a potentially necessary or positive thing for living in society. He also mentioned that some types of repressions uh, sublimate uh, and uh, sublimate slash transform uh, an instinctual good into a higher, more beautiful form, like love. Uh, the idea of moving from uh, having sex or, or love with whoever you want, whenever you want, towards the idea of, of marriage creates the possibility for this idea of romantic love. And so we, we give something up that's instinctual and we get something back which uh, hopefully is, uh, is more beautiful. And Freud would extend this analysis to violence in the sense that we give up on violence if we actually want to live in a society which has a lot of people. Uh, we give up on uh, honor fights. We give up on, on a lot of things that we might have embraced at some point earlier in our history in order to have, uh, in order to explore new possibilities inherent in living in a, uh, living in a large society. And so the idea of, of giving up things that might seem really nice to us on some level, whether instinctual or not, in exchange for the benef benefits of civilization. That's Freud's contribution to this. Now Zizek offers us something a little bit different. He's suggesting that when we consider the idea of violence, we're only considering one of three things that he considers to be violence. Uh, he calls the common sense person hitting another person, uh, going after another person, something like that. He calls this um, to be subjective violence. He's using the term a little bit oddly here, but it, it basically means that uh, he's referring to it having a clear subject and a clear perpetrator. Now he would have us contrast this with two other ideas of violence, although I, I would suggest that if you're not comfortable with the, uh, the use of the, the word violence and you don't think that considering it a metaphor to be a, uh, a decent way to get around this, you could say oppression. So uh, Zizek identifies two other types of, uh, of oppression. Structural oppression is the oppression necessary in order to keep the mechanisms of society working. They're implicit in its structure. Like the idea that uh, police will have to restrain people sometimes. The idea that uh, which most people give far too much credit uh, towards the idea that, that uh, defending property uh, is uh, do, uh, per performing violence is worthwhile to uh, protect property or, or really to protect property claims. We could imagine alternative ways to think about property where uh, like if we didn't have property at all then uh, but still kept the idea of a person being relatively inviolate, then, then this idea of if somebody takes a wallet and you hit them because of it, uh, you're necessarily the one uh, being violent. It doesn't matter that you might choose to claim it, uh, claim that wallet. Now I wouldn't take it, th uh, personally I, I don't accept that weak of a concept of property. But I would suggest that our notions of property should be much more nuanced than they are. And particularly large amounts of property or certain types of property, particularly the means of production, but other legal abstractions would work as well. We should uh, treat them more lightly. Uh, and we should admit many more uh, exceptions to them. So, so we have the what Zizek calls subjective violence, we have structural violence, then we have a third type of violence which uh, Zizek calls objective violence, which is violence which uh, is intrinsic to the uh, use of language. Uh, and this is an area where Zizek is venturing into grounds where I'm not comfortable following him. In, uh, and this is at least partly because it, it, uh, it it's, it's a division that uh, 
It's a division in what uh, what I would uh, what Americans would call liberalism, between a, a multiculturalist, perhaps Foucault critical theory derived liberalism, which is aiming for a lot more respect and dignity of peoples uh, than I am. And then there's the, the, the branch of liberalism where, uh, uh, where, I, uh, where I reside, which uh, I mean, it, it's not that I'm any l uh, more or less radical, but it's rather I'm on a different branch. Um, but this style of analysis, uh, uh, the, the one which I don't accept, it suggests that there's a, a type of violence or a type of oppression that comes out of living in a world which is not defined by you, which is potentially hostile or indifferent to your, uh, to your preferred way of looking at things, framing things, thinking about things. And, uh, and so th this is viewed as a type of abuse. It's, it's an abuse or it's an exercise of power inherent in the idea of language. Now, it's not that I'm entirely unsympathetic to this view, but rather my sympathy is very, very small, uh, and my idea of the remedy is just learn to break the frames that you find yourself uh, dealing with in life. Uh, argue for a different framing of issues. Try to transform the way people think and talk about them by persuading them. And if you can't persuade them, tough shit. Uh, you you can talk about the world in a way that makes sense to you and other people can talk about the world in a way that makes sense to them. You can categorize other people uh, however you like, use whatever words you like, although I would suggest that uh, there maybe should be some criticism possible if you're doing so maliciously. But if you're not being malicious, define people however you want. You don't have to recognize identities. You don't have to recognize ethnicities. Uh, you can just ignore them, and so long as you're not uh, discriminating against them uh, in material ways, you're good. Uh, and so that, that's basically the, the stance that my flavor, flavor of liberalism takes. It's that end discrimination by ceasing, t or by, by tolerating difference, and you can tolerate by ignoring. Uh, now, by ignoring, I wouldn't necessarily th say that you should not keep an eye out for when others aren't ignoring, but you can just view these as analyses of the operative rules by which other people live and criticize them based on materially pr uh, problematic aspects of their view. You don't have to tell them how to think, and you probably shouldn't, uh, with very rare exception. But if, if you see violence, uh, if you see a refusal to hire somebody, uh, except when very, very narrowly justified. If you see stuff like that, you should probably keep an eye out and defend people if they need defending, criticize people if they need criticism. But if you just see somebody cracking a joke or not talking in a way that you think is dignified enough for some ethnicity, or if you don't like somebody's symbolism, or you think this person really should be if they claim that they're an artist and uh, you don't recognize that you're being, uh, I'm, I, you don't have to recognize the, the claims that people make about themselves and you should f feel very comfortable um, disagreeing with them on this and just not talking the way that they like, just tolerate them. Uh, anyhow, uh, I didn't actually get to express my positions uh, on this very much in the group because the way that I've tried to run the groups uh, is to act as an enemy of certainty, meaning that I'm playing the devil's advocate. I'm trying to point out the problems with every perspective that comes up. Whenever anybody seems to be particularly sure, I'll be the devil's advocate and try and find ways to poke holes in their belief. Not that I'm trying to be mean, but I think this is actually the best way that people learn. It's the best way that people also become tolerant of philosophical difference, and it makes them think, and that's really the whole point of having a philosophy group. I'm not trying to steer people towards particular positions. I'm trying to create a good sparring atmosphere, uh, uh, intellectual sparring. 
Um, anyhow, the, the meeting went pretty well. Uh, and the next one that I'm going to do, I'm going to be, uh, I'm taking on a bit more of a challenging topic. I'm going to be doing philosophy of the family. And I'll be talking about two Chinese philosophers, one of which you've probably heard about and the other of which you probably haven't, a Confucius and a Mosi. And the two of them have very different ideas about the obligations that we should have to each other uh, in, in society. Confucius had this idea of being the best that you can to people in your family, really watching out for them. Watching out a little bit less, but still to people in your clan. And you would just have these expanding circles of less and less obliga uh, obligation between, each other, uh, between people in society. Whereas Mosi talked about this idea of a universal love, where justice comes from, uh, well, the, the word justice might be, uh, maybe I'm injecting that wrongly, but the public good is best served by people learning to treat everybody fairly and, and not giving special privilege to um, people in their family. So I haven't scheduled it yet, but I've been enjoying uh, this group. I'm, I'm hoping that I can get enough momentum where I'm not so nervous about it staying together. Uh, because at this point, I'm a little bit nervous about having that ph uh, phenomenon of throwing a party and nobody showing up. Um, if it's successful, then, uh, I mean, if it's successful for long enough, I'll, I'll get to stop worrying about that. But I've never really been all that confident in my ability to manage certain types of social things because I'm an introvert. And particularly with, um, with philosophy, because doing it right means, I think, going after, uh, going after certainty and making people question their foundations, because that's involved, it's, it's a difficult thing for people to face that type of scrutiny. And people who don't, uh, it's, it's easy for people not to have resilience, I guess, not to have enough confidence in the way that they see the world. And uh, not to have enough confidence in themselves or the solidity of, uh, solidity of their arguments, particularly if they haven't spent enough time thinking about their foundations. Uh, and so it's easy for them to run away rather than deal with this kind of thing. And this is partly why philosophy is a, it's a rare pursuit. It's, it's an even rarer pursuit to be done properly. Um, because the, the path of inquiry, uh, it's, it's a rough one. And it means learning to question every bit of your philosophical uh, makeup. And a lot of people aren't, aren't willing or able to do that. And a lot of people won't read books that challenge their worldview, that go strongly against their worldview. A lot of people will, will do this kind of walking away if they encounter somebody who, uh, who makes them, or who pushes at the foundations of their ideas. And, and, and so, or, I mean, or, or, or they might not walk away, they just might revert to insults, which is just as bad. But um, I'm hoping to find enough of the right people uh, to sustain this group. Another thing that I've been doing recently, uh, which has helped a little bit, is watching debates from uh, something called Intelligence Squared, which is a debate society that started in the UK. It does Oxford-style debates, and it's spread to the United States, to Australia, and recently to Greece. And they, uh, they put their videos online. The Intelligence Squared America and Intelligence Squared UK, they put them up on YouTube, which is great for me. Uh, uh, because I have a Chromecast and I can just do up a lot of good stuff in the evening and um, that usually includes a lot of science but usually I try and mix a debate in there every so often or when a new one comes out that I'm particularly interested in. Um, the Intelligence Squared Australia is using proprietary streaming stuff. Well, I, I guess proprietary is the wrong word. It's using non-YouTube streaming stuff 
and that means it's not so possible to queue it up on my Chromecast, but oh well. Uh, but yeah, the, the benefit of this is it keeps me sharp, and I like that it's covering a lot of the pertinent issues of the day. Usually they'll pick a fairly political or otherwise topical um, uh, topic, and, um, and so they'll have a proposition like the drone strikes uh, are the most effective uh, use of American foreign policy. They'll get two or three people for it, two or three people against it, and you'll see a good debate from experts. And usually you'll be less sure at the end of the, uh, of the debate of whatever your position uh, was. And I think that's healthy. Uh, it challenges you even if it's not as interactive as having a philosophical society to do it for you. Um, yeah, so anyhow, that's, that's what I've been doing philosophically so far uh, living in, in Brooklyn. Um, hopefully I'll be able to keep this rich diet of um, keep this rich diet of intellectual intake. Um, it's, it's actually better than anywhere I've lived before, but it, it just takes certain amounts of energy to keep yourself in those currents. And, uh, but at, on the upside, it, it actually helps produce energy, usually for staying in the stream, but you never know. But anyhow, I've, I've been liking it so far, and uh, I've enjoyed talking about it uh, with you. If you have any questions or comments, I'd be happy to engage uh, in the comments section.